Hey guys, we're going way back on this one, old school again. This time, we'll go through the factory famous Cleveland Cranks, the 4MA, the 4MAB, and the Aussie 351 stamped crank. These cranks are factory nodular iron, car steel, a little stronger than your normal average car steel. Now, I remember using the normal um, Aussie 351 stamped Cleveland Cranks in all my 2v headed combos uh in the day that i've spoken about before but on my um old 10 second naturally aspirated 4v combination i ran a very special modified 4mab crank that yes that's right i spent around 800 dollars fully modifying it back in the 90s aftermarket steel cranks um you know it was out of the question really and uh, even aftermarket alloy heads, steel rods and all that business were far from reach and out of the question as far as, you know, being able to afford it and, and things like that back then. Anyway, this crank of mine, we were in search of um, any hidden, you know, um, power, you know, quick RPMs to help fill them 4Vs with speed, with airspeed. Um, now, the 4MAB is the crank everyone wanted to score, you know, especially back in the days. Apparently found in all the Aussie GTs and the US BOSS 351s, said to have been a stronger grade of cast nodular iron. I'm not sure really, to be honest. Some say the B is for Brinnell tested over the normal 4MA, um, you know, but then some say that's baloney. It's just no more than a casting revision code or something like that. And as far as the normal Aussie 351 stamped crank, that was everywhere, uh, you know, back then. And, and, you know, looked at as to, you know, be being the bottom of the range type of Cleveland crank, but will do on 450 plus horsepower builds anyway. And some will actually argue that and say that it's actually just as strong as all the others, like the 4MA and the 4MAB. Who knows? But all I know is that the 4MAB was always found on the performance 4V models and some big fair lanes, etc. Now that's a good enough reason to me that says it's factory badass. Don't you agree? Anyway, off to my local machine shop, LW Parry machine shop, near to me. That was family operated with, you know, employees, obviously. They were around forever, those guys, and everyone around here near me would remember them, especially, you know, back in the day. Anyway, we've sat down together and, you know, I told them that's what, you know, we wanted to do, find some tricks in the machine work and keep, you know, still keep it a short 351 uh, stock rod length also. I'll get to that a little bit later. So I asked if the crank can be lightened and knife edged, meaning, you know, the motion face edge, um, you know, of the counterweight to be to be machined and contoured down to a knife edge look. So not only keeping the crank light now, but it's also helping it slice through all that windage and oil down there. Is you know, it's where it benefits really. Didn't stop at that, um, of course, because now we've removed. Um, you know so much metal in doing that it required mallory slugs to get the thing balanced right and even back then they weren't cheap those um mallory slugs like you know each you know per it was like 50 bucks per slug or something like that mallory slugs are a heavy metal that are installed into your counterweights for balancing so you know they're, they're drilled and pressed in depends on the job you may need one or three to get it right and you know it just depends now, once, once again, once you tamper with a component surface, like we've just done, it's critical that you retreat that entire component again, just as it you know, were from the factory foundry. But in this case, we had nitrided it afterwards, and um, nitriding the crank is like a heat treatment and a surface hardening treatment. He sat in the nitriding process for a couple of days. I remember it was like two or three days actually he sat in there. I remember. And once it came out, it looked like, you know, it came out of a charcoal bonfire. <laughs> um, it had like a whitish, greyish, uh, brownish look, I remember. Prior to all this, all the oil holes were chamfered, you know, and things like that. All the prep work, um, the usual stuff was all done already. 
And lastly, the journals were all micro-polished and it was ready to rock and roll, this 4MAB. Um, this crank I spun, you know, I personally, in my own, you know, 10-second uh, combination, I spun this crank to 7,650 RPM on a number of occasions, especially on the short shift that will, you know, usually carry top gear higher up in the RPMs over the line when you do that. But it usually seen, you know, 7,300 to 7,400 on, you know, on the norm, like on the change and through the traps. It said that these cranks were used in many early day pro stockers, both in the US and down under. And uh, spun, you know, guys have spun these cranks as high as 9,000 RPMs with, you know, alloy rods hanging off them. And in recent YouTube videos and interviews, early Clevo pro stock racers have actually said that, you know, also, and they've, and that they have, you know, used these cranks and spun them that high. So that's pretty cool. Um, Hank the crank was actually the first um, to make and develop a uh, custom steel crank for the Cleveland Pro Stockers and Racers um, back in 1974. So that's, you know, pretty cool and badass. But these 4MAB uh, cranks also had, uh, you know, they, they also held their own for, for what they were. And many builders out there will say that they've never seen or heard of any letting, you know, letting them down and failing or letting go. As long as you kept on top of it and, you know, with routine checks and inspections between, you know, major rebuilds, things were sweet with them. Um, so how did this badass crank behave in my build back then? You're probably thinking, well, it definitely revved up quicker. Um, that's for sure. You know, something a large port 4V headed, um, you know, combination can use, to be honest. For example, I could be cruising in top gear. It was a two-speed glide. Um, I could be cruising in top gear at say two and a half thousand RPMs and just stand on it in top gear, you know, while it's in top gear and it'll just pull from down low RPM and then slowly and then violently offload the tires also. It was, you know, it was pretty phenomenal. And you have people out there, you know, reading fairy tales that the, you know, large port 4V has no download torque or power, blah, blah, blah. It's all baloney, mate. Not mine. Total opposite with, say, you know, 3000 LB in street trim, it got up and, you know, it, it got up and go all right, I tell you. Now, going back to the short rod, um, as is, factory, 5.78 inch rod, you know, three, um, you know, your normal 351 Cleveland rod length. Although fully prepped, um, also, I had them like chopping, side polish, you know, the ARP, stronger rod bolts, and, you know, I had the little lens bushed for, you know, floating pins and pistons and all that business. A lot of guys don't know that a shorter rod travels down the bore at a faster rate compared to, say, a taller rod in the same, you know, in the same deal. On the downstroke, this is from top dead center on the downstroke. It actually travels at a faster rate. And, you know, it, look, I won't get into it. That's, you know, there's a lot of explanation into that and, you know, geometry talk yeah it's a bit weird but something the large port 4v likes especially with you know big compression and mine had oh, by memory had like 12.8 12.8 to 1 or something like that especially with comp like that firing away making that rod drawing fast airspeed on the downstroke filling them large ports rapidly thus promoting torque from you know early like mine down low all the way to red line like i experienced it was pretty badass. Something the Ford engineers got right, I think, from, you know, the get-go. So, yeah, um, there you go, guys. Just a quick insight to the Cleveland 4MAB crank. Um, and, and, you know, especially on my old 10-second 4V Cleveland that I'd run. And in conclusion, I think whenever you can reduce some, you know, reciprocating mass and valve train gear on a naturally aspirated deal... It's always, you know, going to be a win-win situation, I think. Thanks, guys.